I want to start with uh, the org reviews that we didn't get to last week. So do I, is there a volunteer for somebody who wants to kind of walk through their org? I have a question. Um, okay. Uh, somebody have a question real quick? What's that, Dave? question about the minimum. You're a little muffled. Can you speak up a little bit? Uh, sure. Let me get closer to the mic. Is that better? Yes. Thank you. What's What's the minimum dollar amount that a nonprofit has to has to be at, and what is to be considered? Well, they have to file the full nine ninety. Um, so as long as they're not filing the 990 easy, we can usually uh, we can usually accept them. We find that the organization is less than 200,000. Sometimes the percentages get skewed because you know it's hard to manage, you know, for for less than 40,000. So it looks like it's higher than than the 10 percent. But uh, as long as we kind of get a sense of it, we're good. But we just don't want an organization that's filling out the full 990. And organizations are allowed to do it even if they are fall under the, the easy um, uh, minimum there. Does that help? Yes, thanks. OK. Uh, Shaylee, you're up. OK. Uh, organization, organization, you're up. I did. Let me uh, okay. let me mute let me mute everybody else so that okay. we have the floor here. All right, take it away. Okay, the organization that I chose is called the Let It Be Foundation. If you're to look it up, make sure you put the in front because that that is a critical word I found. The Let It Be Foundation. And they are out of Chino, and their main purpose is to assist families of children who are diagnosed with cancer or other life-threatening illnesses. And I chose this particular organization just because cancer has affected my family, a couple of my family members. I've lost a sister from it. My mom is diagnosed with cancer. So this struck a chord with me. The basic things that they offer is they provide home care essentials such as food, gas, house cleaning, yard maintenance, so many other different things for these families. They're trying to help restore normality in the family basically during this time where everything is just uh, upheaval for the family when they find out their child has this type of disease. So they help them ev everywhere from their faith to to grief support, to offering bedside activities for the kids at their hospital bed, to have like backpacks full of supplies, supplies for the parents if they're needing to stay overnight, um, care kits, baskets during the holidays. They create events for the kids to be able to, you know, have a fun activity for them. I believe they're having a great impact. I mean, it's very relative though. It's hard dollar wise to be able to put an impact on what they're doing because so much of it has to do with emotional support for the families but i believe it's touching the lives of many families spiritually emotionally even financially when it comes to maybe food or gas or whatever the family's needing during that time but another aspect of this organization that i really like is that not only are they helping these families but they have a not a mentorship, it's like a leadership program for teenagers, those in seventh grade to 12th grade, where they offer an opportunity for kids to be able to serve and to learn life skills, learn how to fundraise. They have to create fundraising opportunities themselves, really to get them out of their own element and their own world in those teenage years, which they most certainly can be in. So I really like that aspect that they offer that as a side part to their organization. Um, 
So that's basically about the organization as far as the 990. Their total revenue for the year was 248, 249, we'll just round up, $1,000. They did have in their 990 that they, they help, the recipients were 100 people, 100 recipients. So it came out to about $2,500 per person that they're spending. I don't know how accurate that number is or not. Um, they have a fab fabulous website that I learned a lot of information from them. There's only one person that is actually paid in their organization. Their CEO salary is $30,000 and she works 40 hours a week. The only thing I did have a question on and stop me if I'm rambling, I'm sorry, just keep going. You're doing fine. But, okay, I do have a question. On line seven, on page 10, where it lists other salaries and wages. Yeah. I'm not real sure what that is composed of because they only show that the CEO gets paid 30,000 a year. Should I question that <coughs> amount that's there? No, if you look on page one, Uh huh. Um, you'll uh, line five. It says number of individuals employed in calendar year two thousand and fourteen is four. Yes. yes, sir. So, in the salaries page, they're only required to show <coughs> key employees and anyone making more than a hundred thousand. Okay. So if they only show one there, that means they're just saying that that one person is a key employee. The other three. Are apparently not key employees, but I mean they're 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 working for the company, and and um, the sum of those three is where the other salaries come from. Okay. So if I'm here and I see compensation to key employees thirty thousand, which she is, you know, which is listed under here under pure management. Uh, which could actually be split probably if that person's doing some work that's not pure management. And then the other salaries and wages are the other three people. So they're averaging 40,000 or so. Okay. So sorry. Okay. Okay, that's understood. I appreciate you explaining that to me. I didn't know if that was something I should worry about because the amount seemed high. So I don't know if there if that's a way that they hide no, 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 no. The only thing that seems high is this forty thousand dollars under office expenses. Okay. Um. <clears throat> Can you point out to me? The, oh, I found. I found line thirteen. Yeah. Again, that's not anything I'd expect you to look at, but I was looking at okay. the total management expenses as being, uh, you know, s close to thirty percent, and. Um, it just seems like the bulk of that is they're not splitting the salaries, which is fine. You know, if I can mentally split the salaries, but the fact that they're spending forty thousand dollars on office expenses um, seems strange to me. I mean, they're only paying forty thousand total in rent, um, so I'm not quite sure is what that it is. Where that would be bulked under. The rent would be under office expenses? Or rent no? is under occupancy on line 16. Oh, I see, okay. So, so they're, they're spending like $40,000 on staplers, that sounds weird. You, you should straight ask the organization. I noticed this expense on your on your 990 form and ask, sorry, ask you leave that alone. Yeah, you'll, they'll shock them, but you're absolutely allowed to ask them that question. Okay. Okay. I will do that then. Okay. Yeah, they're showing zero in fundraising, which is interesting. Um, I was just going to look at sources of, of revenue here. Uh, yeah, I show no, no money for fundraising. They're showing fundraising events. Um, Yeah, so they said they raised all their money through fundraising events, but they're not showing any event expenses. Um, right. So I don't know if they're, 
you know, doing some sort of event that doesn't cost them any money, or maybe that's, you know, that's their office expenses. It, it, that's a little, it's just a missing piece of the puzzle here. Okay. So if you look here on 8A, it says gross income from fundraising events, 541,000, less expenses, zero. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you could ask them what kind of fundraising events that they have that don't cost them any money. Okay, I will ask. And maybe that's office expenses. <laughs> could, you know, some people just don't know how to fill out the form, which is fine. I, I, I mean, I don't penalize them for that. I just have to ask the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. But other than that, you know, the organization seems sound. Uh, um, did you, did she tell you about the Ronald McDonald House experience that we get that we had? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's it's nice to find organizations that you know are more. Uh, close to the individuals and a larger percentage is going directly to the individuals so that's good anyone else, anyone else have questions all right All right, so the title for today's discussion is Freeing Up Resources for Generosity. Uh, on, let me, I'm hearing an echo, so I'm just going to mute. There we go. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, your own personal financial situation without asking you what your personal financial situation is. It's just going to give you a chance to think about it. So, uh, let's see. Somebody in Corona, will you unmute and finish this, uh, this cliche for me? A penny saved? Is a penny earned? Yeah, do you know who said that? Benjamin Franklin. Good, Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> now, what's the, here's the bonus question. What does it mean? What does it mean, Tim? It means if you don't spend your money, you're gonna save your money, right? Or you, you've earned it. Yeah, that not spending a penny is the same as going out and earning a penny because in the end you have a penny right so that's that's the gist of, of that one um, along comes a guy in the 80s and he says well in reality a penny saved is two pennies earned And the reason he said that is because half of the half of your earnings are getting sucked away by taxes. So if you want to buy a four dollar cup of coffee, you have to earn eight dollars because when you go off and earn eight dollars when you get your paycheck after it's taken away Social Security and Medicare and federal and state and after you pay sales tax, um, you're down to plus or minus half of what you started with depending on your tax bracket. So you want to be thinking of every $4 cup of coffee is actually costing you $8. Um, We've gone a step beyond that and said, well, actually, depending on how you buy it, a penny saved is three pennies earned. And do you know in what circumstance that's true? If you use credit? If you use credit, right. So if you 
use your credit card um, to buy that cup of coffee and then you make minimum payments then you're paying a, a big percent of interest on on that which increases the overall cost when you when you lay it uh, all the way across so <clears throat> if you have really gross uh, credit it can double the price uh, but it's easily 50 50 percent more if you just make the minimum payments so I'm going to walk you through some of that um, we'll do a little exercise in a, in a few minutes but we're going to talk about various perspectives that people have on personal finances and you know you may see yourself saying these things or you or you may be uh, or, or may not but some people will say hey if I have money in my checking account I can afford it or worse yet hey if my credit card hasn't reached its limit then I can afford it might as well buy it so is that true if you have money in your checking account does that mean you can afford it if you walk into Best Buy and there's a new toy no because not everything uh, is uh, beneficial yeah, it's not even beneficial, but even worse, you may not be able to afford it because the money in your checking account may be for rent or ongoing utility payments or ongoing car payments or that kind of thing. Um, but the people that are super short-sighted are only looking at, hey, is this going to go through? Is my debit card going to work? Is my credit card going to work? Um, and you end up getting stuck in this <coughs> um, always being in a critical situation so <clears throat> if you want to get beyond that you have to start thinking about the fact that your that your purchases are costing two or three times and that if you want to be able to afford something it probably means that you're gonna to have to give up something else unless you're just in a situation where you're piling up cash month, month after month which you know that may be some of you that's great but that's not everybody so let's uh, let's go through an exercise here so suppose you have a credit card and I'm picking 24% interest and somebody complains and says that's you know too high but I've seen credit cards with that interest rate and it makes the math easier so if it's not your situation then you know the math is going to be a little harder to do but 24 percent interest means how much interest per month everybody at once 24 divided by 12 is two percent so if I have a $10,000 balance, 2% of $10,000, so I move the decimal place over twice and then double it, I'm going to pay $200 a month in interest. So my 3% minimum payment is $300. Out of that 3%, two thirds of it is going to uh, interest. And only 100 of that is going to pay off the, the credit card. So if you only make the minimum payment, how long do you think it'll take to pay off that credit card, given that situation? Anybody have a guess? Ten years. Ten years? Anybody thinks it's more or less? I think it's like three times as fast if I remember correctly. So if I look at just making the minimum payment, 
And all I look at is I get the bill, I look at the word minimum payment, and I write the check for that. Or I set up auto pay to always pay the minimum payment. <clears throat> then it's going to take 25 years to pay it off. Wow. And do you know why it's 25 years? Because the minimum payment changes every month. So if you, um, if you pay $300 this month and it knocks off $100 off the principal, your minimum payment next month is going to be $297. So out of that 297, you know, 198 of it's going to be interest, and 97 of 99 of it's going to be going to be to pay pay down the debt. But each t each month, you're paying less and less towards paying off the debt. If you always say, "I'm just going to make the minimum payment," uh, so you have to watch. So if you're saying, "I'm going to make a commitment," to pay off my debt, <clears throat> you want to look at the minimum payment today, and if it's $300, at a minimum you want to say, okay, I'm going to pay $300 every month until this thing is paid off, instead of where it says the minimum payment, because making the minimum payment is not going to pay it off. So you can see the minimum payment is going down and down and down and down. Now, that assumes that you're not putting any more money on the card. If you continue to put more money on the card, of course, you're never going to pay it off. Um, but what if we said, okay, I'm going to make a $300 payment no matter what, no matter what the minimum says. Instead of paying it off in 25 years, how long do you think it's going to take to pay it off? And I'm using, you know, a, you know, an online calculator here that, that you can, you know, go to creditcards.com and run it yourself with your, with your particular situation. It'll now take 56 months to pay it off. So I've gone from 25 years to less than five years just by committing to say 300 bucks instead of just looking at the words minimum payment and making the minimum payment. Now again, you've got to either cut up the card or put it in a drawer or decide you're not going to use it. Now, what if you said, okay, I'm going to scrape up an extra seven bucks a day, one less Starbucks, one less candy bar or whatever it is, and instead of making $300 a month payments, I'm going to make $500 a month payments. Then you've gone from 25 years to five years to two years. And two years, gosh, that seems like you can watch it move down and feel good about it. So it becomes you know, a solvable problem. So if you don't focus on it, it's going to take 25 years or you'll never pay it off if you're continuing to use the card. <clears throat> if you focus on it, sacrifice a little bit here, say I'm going to give up this or that, I'm going to eat in instead of eat out, um, you can just pay that whole thing off in a couple of years. So that's just math and a little bit of effort and a little bit of thought. So if you have multiple credit cards, um, the easiest thing to do is to look, write them all down, total debt, take the smallest one and attack the smallest one with a vengeance. So they call that the debt snowball. And the reason is because you have a minimum payment on all these cards and if you can get rid of a minimum payment, you could take that whole minimum payment and apply it to the next one. 
also gives you a, a mental win. Like, cool, I've just paid off one, and now I'm going to go to the next one. And you get to the point where you only have one. That's less overwhelming than if you have five. <clears throat> so in most cases, you can ignore the interest rate and just pick them off with the smallest balance first. If you're a math head and you want to go after the highest, higher interest rate, that's fine. It's really the effort that's, that's the biggest difference, not the $10 you're going to save um, in interest. Um, some proverbs we picked out. Um, Whoever loves ple pleasure will become poor. Whoever loves wine and olive oil will never be rich. Not that I've met anybody that says I'm a real olive oil lover, but, you know, hey. Those were the days of wine and olive oil. Um, the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. Proverbs to consider. <clears throat> So why, in general, are Americans in so much debt? Well, we have this culture perpetrated by what? Perpetrated by television ads, right? Like, you can't possibly survive unless you have the latest iPhone and the latest this and the latest that. So this notion of material is wanting stuff. And if you say, hey, I'm going to keep buying until I no longer want stuff, <laughs> it doesn't work, OK? Your wants don't seem to let up. Uh, people that are driven by a need for financial success and possessions tend to be less happy than people that don't. So, um, things to think about. Uh, money is a root of all kinds of evil. Here's for my bi biblical scholars. Is this a biblical quote? No. No, it's the love of money. No, it's the love of money. So technically it's in there, but it's taken out of context. So here's the, here's the context. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. So if we just looked at this, at, you know, this passage and say, what are the characteristics of people who want to get rich? What's the first one? People who want to get rich fall into temptation. What's the second characteristic of people who want to get rich? They fall into a trap. What's the third characteristic of people who wanted to get rich? They are plunged into ruin and destruction. Sounds great, huh? <laughs> What's the next one? Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith, and the last thing, they've pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, does this say people who are rich? Nope. No, these are not characteristics of people who are rich. These are people who want to get rich or richer. Right? So it doesn't matter what, where you stand today. 
if your goal in life is to be richer, then according to this, you've got six wonderful things to look forward to. Okay, including ruin and destruction and many griefs and all kinds of evil. So <clears throat> we may talk about being rich, but if I'm looking just at this particular passage, it's not saying you can't be rich. It's just saying watch out <coughs> if your goal in life is to be richer. All right. Um, this is a new slide for this class. Uh, I had somebody say, yeah, but can't you use credit cards effectively? Okay. The answer is some people can and some people can't. And you've got to figure out what kind of people you are. Okay. I use that blue-green 2% cash back card. So I get 2% back on every purchase that I make. But I don't pay any interest because I pay off the card every month. I don't spend money um, that I don't have. Uh, there are people that say that spending cash is harder than spending credit cards. It's easy to whip out a piece of plastic. It's harder to whip out a 20 because then that seems more real. Um, I can tell you for me personally, it's just as painful either way. I can tell you for my wife personally, she's not on the phone today, so, you know, <laughs> it's just as easy for her either way. You know, a 20 and a credit card, you know, are, are the same. So, and, and I'm not dissing her, she's, she's great, but, but uh, you know, for some, it's not necessarily, for some people say, well, gosh, if I have to pull out a 20, then that seems like real money. And if, that's, and if that helps you to not overspend, then you can do the whole envelopes thing and the cash only thing. Um, but uh, I am not a thou shalt not use any credit card ever because I think people with the right discipline can, can do it. All right. Somebody thought I was lying when I said three pennies earned, so I came up with an example. Young couple lives paycheck to paycheck. It's her 25th birthday, so he decides to surprise her with a weekend trip to San Francisco. Seems like, you know, San Francisco's only that far away, shouldn't be any big deal. But two airline tickets, two nights at the hotel, rental car, a couple of nice meals, and they've spent $1,000 in a heartbeat that they didn't have. So <clears throat> he gets his credit card bill, and he's like, okay, I'm going to pay it off by paying $35 a month. But in order to pay it from $35, he had to earn how much? Well, you back out the math, he had to earn $63. If he has a 18% interest credit card, then of his $35 that he's um, spending to pay it off, $15 of that is interest. So he's having to earn $63 pay down $20 in debt. That's triple. So we had a $3,000 vacation, not a $1,000 vacation. So the math really works that way. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so any questions or comments on that? All right, my, my voice is failing, so I think we'll call it a day. <coughs> um, let you go. Uh, who has not presented yet their org review? Anybody? So we'll expect to hear from you guys next week. 
Um, and if you have not yet done so, please uh, email a copy of your review to the email address so that uh, we can pass those along to the board and the board will uh, try to get those voted on uh, in the near future. Thank you all. Thanks for joining us. Hope you learned something. We'll see you next week.